Okay, before we start, I do again want to do a little shout out to our ASL interpreters who have been doing a super job here today. So it's always important. All right, I want to just introduce you to Gail Osterberg, who's Director of Communications at the Library of Congress. Doesn't that sound great? So, Gail, welcome. Thank you so much. You run a very tight ship over here on the fiction stage. Welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. We spend such a long number of months preparing for this event, and it's always so exciting to be here and to see you all come out and celebrate books and reading with us here at the Convention Center. So thank you. Thank you for coming and spending your Saturday with us. I also want to take a minute and say thank you to our many sponsors who not only um, make it possible for this to be a free event, but just to have the event. It, it just wouldn't take place without all of their generosity and support. Many, thank you. Thank you. Many of them have booths down on the expo floor, so if you happen to be down there and see Wells Fargo, the Washington Post, IMLS, NEA, NEH, many others, um, tell them thank you. That would be so wonderful. And if you're interested in donating yourself, um, it's very easy, loc.gov slash donate. No contribution is too small, and it will go a long way to helping us make sure that we can continue to have this event each year. Now, our next guest, and I want to tell you this um, first so that you write it down and, and remember her book signing is from 4.30 to 5.30 in line number seven, so make a note. She is the best-selling author of 30 novels, many telling rich stories of the South with wonderful women protagonists who are navigating life's changes. Her most recent novel, Before We Were Yours, is a compelling and heartbreaking story inspired by actual events that occurred in Tennessee over three decades in the early 20th century. Everyone is reading this book. How many of you have read this book? I posted a picture of it when I was reading it at the beach earlier um, this summer, and all of my friends immediately commented, um, and I thought I would share just a few of them because um, I think that they were very on target. That was one of those books I wished didn't end. This book gave voice to thousands of children who deserve to have their story told. This took a heartbreaking story and made it something that I could not put down. My view is that this writer not only has revealed something troubling about our collective history, but she's also told us a beautiful and inspirational story about second chances. I loved this book and I can't wait to hear her talk about it. Please welcome to the stage for her debut National Book Festival appearance, Lisa Wingate. Well, good afternoon. Um, this kind of room is sort of my dream room, a room full of book people. Uh, I have been a book nerd since Ms. Crackhart told me in the first grade that I would be a writer someday. And I just believed her because first grade teachers don't lie. <laughs> There's this thing when you're young and, and you want to be a writer, and I've been writing stories um, all my life, but there's this thing you dream of, you think you will grow up and you will become a writer, and it will be like what you see on TV. And on TV, writers drive around in Ferraris, and they live at the beach, and, and they go in the grocery store, and everybody knows who they are. And you never actually see them writing. They just go around being writers. But you get into this business, and you find out it's not really like that for most people. Most people are going to work long and hard um, to achieve even a full-time living in writing. It's a tough business, uh, but you always dream that you will have that book, that book that just blasts out into the world and takes on a life of its own. And this book for me has been that dream book. It's not my first book. This is actually um, novel number 30 for me. 
So I'm kind of an example of how to achieve your dream in 30 novels or less. <laughs> but thank you. This story, my agent put the call out on a Wednesday. By Thursday, 10 of the biggest publishers in New York wanted to see it. By Friday, we had uh, what for me was a huge preempt offer on the book, if we would uh, sell it then and not send it to auction. My agent said, I don't think we should take it. I think we should let it go to auction. I think we'll do better. So I kind of squeaked out, OK, if that's what you think is best. <laughs> and those things always happen on a Friday so that you can fret about it all weekend, <laughs> which I did. And, um, but by Monday, it was going to auction, and it sold to Random House, Valentine, uh, a division of Random House, and ended up with the most amazing crew of longtime publishing professionals who have worked together for years and have been fantastic to this book and never ending in their support of it. So the book came out uh, a year ago, June, and the first week it came out, it landed just a few slots off of the New York Times list. And unfortunately, that's not like horseshoes. You don't get points for being close. <laughs> so everyone was saying to me, Lisa, your book is doing great. But what they weren't saying was, but it landed just off the times list. And usually you figure your first week, maybe your first and second week, are really your only chance because um, that's when all your pre-sales come in and whatnot. So it didn't make it then. It didn't make it again. We thought it was still steaming along. We thought maybe July 4th week, you know, because nobody puts out a lot of um, their heavy-duty books on the 4th of July weekend. It didn't make it then. This book crept its way onto the New York Times list eight weeks out, which hardly ever happens. And it wasn't because Oprah called or anything like that. Uh, it was just people. It was just the power of word of mouth. It was people who read it, who told someone, who crammed it into someone's hand in an airport bookstore, who told their book group, we should read this. Um, it was just people who shared it with people. So if you think it doesn't matter that we still talk about stories, that we still talk about things that impassion us, things that matter to us, things that grab us by the heart and soul, uh, it does. There is still incredible power in just the sharing of story. And if you really think about it, National Book Festival, um, we could have an international book festival and we could invite people from every culture and if language were not a barrier, we would all have this one thing in common. Um, from a chalet in France to a city in America to a village in Africa, that we all process the world through story in some way. We all catalog our history through story. And so for me, that is, is such a magnificent thing, and it's the best thing. Now I'm thrilled we didn't make the New York Times list our first week out, because there's no better way for me for this dream to have come true uh, than for the book to make it eight weeks out. And it has actually stayed there ever since. So um, whatever else happens, thank you. Whatever else comes of this book, it's already been the dream for me. I'll answer a few of the questions that people ask me the most about it, and then uh, whatever you want to know, I would love to answer any questions that you have. People always ask, and that you always get in the press interviews when a book is coming out, does any of this come from your own life? Uh, did you experience any of this? Is this your family history? In this story, um, and in case you don't know the story, it's based around a piece of history that was America's largest adoption scandal, which took place from the 20s through the 50s in Memphis um, under the um, direction of a woman named Georgia Tan who ran the Tennessee Children's Home Society and pretty much ran adoption within Memphis and within the state of Tennessee and specialized in providing children 
for the wealthy and the famous. Many Hollywood celebrities, um, Joan Crawford, June Allison, Dick Powell, um, politicians adopted through her. The, um, while many of the children were orphans, many of them were also just stolen from poor families to fill orders. So that is the history this book is wrapped around. Uh, I don't have, I'm, I'm not close to the history of it on the adoption side. There aren't a lot of adoptions in my family, none I'm close to. My brothers used to try to tell me I was adopted. <laughs> we look so much alike that there would be teachers, substitute teachers would look at me and say, you have a brother in the sixth grade, don't you? And I hope you're nothing like him. <laughs> so as a little girl, not only is that frightening, but it's not a confidence builder to be told you look like your brothers. <laughs> but where I felt the closest to this story, or one of the places I felt close to it, because this story is, because the true history is in Memphis, um, it's a river story. If you know anything about Memphis, if you've ever been there, if you've spent time there, Memphis is a river town. The river is the heart and soul and lifeblood of Memphis. The showboats, the paddle wheelers, that's the identity of Memphis. Um, and I do know about life on a river. As a kid, I grew up in this little sort of horseshoe-shaped 1970s neighborhood where every house sat on an acre or two or five. And right through the middle of this neighborhood ran this little dirt-bottomed Oklahoma Creek. And it was just a, a trickle on a summer day. A couple times a year when it really rained, it had come up and flood some of the low-lying houses. But to us kids, that creek was every river from the Nile to the Amazon to the Congo in darkest Africa. And you know, we were Tarzan and Zorro and Laura Ingalls Wilder and Swiss Family Robinson. And if we, had, if we had read it in a book or seen it on TV, we went down in that creek and we played it by the hour. And nobody had to tell us kids how to make up a story. We just did it because we were bored and we, there was nothing to do back in those days unless it was Saturday morning and there were cartoons on. And so we'd go down that creek and about once a week we would make up our minds that we were gonna go farther down that creek than any kid in the history of the neighborhood had ever been before. And we'd pack a little backpack and we'd set out in the morning and we'd journey and journey and we'd stop at some point and have our lunch and we'd go on and we'd go until we thought we had traveled for miles. And we would start to tell each other scary stories about how far away from home we were and maybe we wouldn't get home before dark and maybe our mamas would have to call the police to come look for us and kidnappers might get us and we might need to defend ourselves from wild animals. And we'd get about half scared and then it would get to be sort of supper time and the thing about that creek was it had an arbor of trees over it. You couldn't tell time of day down there unless it was high noon and the sun was coming straight down. You had no cognition of time of day. So it would get toward evening and a lot of you in this room probably remember what happened when it got to be about supper time back in those days. Um, the mama calls would go out across the neighborhood. So we would be down in the Congo looking for lost tribes of man or out on the prairie with Laura Ingalls Wilder and we'd hear, Laura, Lisa, Annabeth. And we would come up out of that creek and we were still in someone's backyard the whole time. <laughs> but the thing about it was because that creek was its own little world, because it was dug down into the soil, because you didn't hear voices, you didn't hear cars, you didn't hear people up top, it was its own universe you were not conscious of what was happening above the banks. And that is exactly the life these kids are living in this story on this little shanty boat that their parents built in the Mississippi River right up until they dock up in Memphis and their lives intersect with what is going on in Memphis in 1939. People ask me, um, 
how did I come across the true piece of history, Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society? Why did I decide to write about it? Why did I put it in a novel? Uh, for me, every story has a spark, and I never know what that spark is going to be, but something will come across my mind from somewhere, just a story someone tells me, something I read in the newspaper, a historical marker when we've stopped to empty the trash on a family vacation. I never know, but something will come across my path, and it just explodes my mind, and I think, why didn't I know about that? Do other people not know about? What, what more is there to know? How did that happen? The spark for this story I came across uh, completely accidentally. I had never heard of it, which is odd, because I've spent quite a bit of time in Memphis, but nobody had ever come to me and said, you know, if you want a great story to dig into, there was this woman and she sold all these thousands of kids into adoptions and made herself wealthy and um, I had never heard of it. But where I felt closest to it and where it most exploded my mind and drove my passion when I came across the truth was as a parent. Because as much as I love writing and sharing stories and storytelling and meeting people and all of the things that go with this life of story, my favorite job was still being a mom to two little boys. And as I'm digging into the true history of Georgia Tan and the, children, and the Children's Home Society, what happened to these kids who were plucked up out of their lives through no fault of their own, and dropped in an orphan house and they don't know what's going on, why they're there, what's happening, there's no counseling going on. They literally are in their lives one day and not the next. And as I'm studying up on this after I first heard about it, I'm thinking of my own kids at two and four and six and eight, these two little pieces of my heart and how innocent they were and how helpless they were, and what if, how would they have handled something like this? And I'm thinking of myself as a parent, you know, what if one day someone took my kids and I couldn't find them and I couldn't help them and I couldn't get to them and I maybe didn't even ever know where they were and perhaps I never saw them again. What would that be like? And to just put you in that headspace a little bit, uh, imagine with me now, it's the 20s through the 50s sometime. Uh, you are a person who desperately wants to be a parent. You come from a culture where within about a year of the wedding, everybody has babies, it's just, it's what's done, not less than nine months from the wedding. My grandmother's first baby was born nine months to the day, and we came that close to being the town scandal. But it never happens for you. And you maybe apply to adopt maybe through your Catholic orphanage or your children's home in the town or children's services or whatever's around you. And maybe because you have a divorce in your history, maybe just because you're older by that time. Maybe because you and your husband are different religions. Uh, for whatever reason, there's never a child for you. You get to a certain age, it becomes clear there never will be a child for you. And then all of a sudden, you hear, maybe you hear it from a friend, maybe you read about it in a newspaper, um, maybe you open your Saturday Evening Post in 1930 and there's this big splashy article called The Baby Market. And it is about this place where you can go and you're gonna be able to make that dream happen just like that. And not only that, you're going to be able to pick hair color, eye color, age, gender, one child or two. Would you like them to look alike or maybe one that looks like your husband and one who looks like you? I mean, it sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Little Stepford children all made to order just the ages and, and colorings and everything that somebody wants. But it's the 20s through the 50s. So these are not robot children, they're real children. And while some of them really are orphans who need homes, the dark side of this history is where the rest of them are coming from. And to put you in that headspace a little bit, imagine the other side of this story. You are a parent who's down on your luck. 
it's maybe the depression and you've lost your farm, dad's lost his job, um, maybe dad has died and, or run out and left the family and you're a woman with a, a, a bunch of kids to take care of. Or maybe you're just a young girl who's gotten yourself in trouble with a man who will not marry you. But for whatever reason, you're desperate, you're hungry, you need medical care or something. You go to a free milk and bread clinic, um, a doctor's office that, that advertises care for people who can't pay, whatever. Um, the people there are very nice to you. They tell you they will solve all your problems. They want you to sign a few forms, which you maybe can or can't read because you quite well may be illiterate. You think all your problems are solved when you leave there? What you don't realize is that you have just been spotted by a doctor, a nurse, a worker in an orphanage, a police officer. You have just crossed the radar of Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society. And it is very likely that someday soon, you will turn around and your children will be gone. And if you even know what happened to them, if you can muster the resources to go to court and try to fight for them, you will simply be told they have been given to people who can give them much more than you can, and you will not be getting them back. That is the startling reality of what happened all these decades in Memphis. When I started to dig into it, I had questions, of course, as you probably do, how could something like this happen? How could it be allowed to go on? Why didn't people stop it? And that was really the basis for starting the novel. I wanted to, I found that it hadn't been talked about very much. I found that um, the state of Tennessee had worked very hard and a lot of people in powerful positions around the country who were in some way tied to these adoptions had worked very hard to quiet it down after the scandal finally broke. I wanted to know what happened to these families and what became of them and how she got away with this. Um, how did I come across it? Completely by accident. I was up late working one night and um, had left the TV playing but had turned off the sound because it, it, it just gets lonesome. When you know you're pulling deadline, you're gonna be up all night and even the dog gives up on you and goes to bed. <laughs> it just gets lonely. So about two in the morning, Discovery Channel's Deadly Women cycled on, and it was an episode called Above the Law, and it was about people who, because of their connections, um, were able to commit heinous crimes and never be prosecuted, and at that point, it was a segment uh, showing this big white house, and the front room was full of babies and bassinets, and I just thought, what in the world is this about? And that was my introduction to the history that became the topic for this book. Um, as I was doing the research, I came across the fact that some of these kids were stolen from camps on the river, that these people who lived in Shan lived the shanty boat on the river, which there were um, tens of thousands living this shanty boat life during the Depression and before and after, and it seemed like such a fascinating life, and I started to hear the voices of these five little kids growing up, these little stair-step siblings growing up on the river, and in particular, the voice of the oldest girl, Rill, who's 12 when the story starts. And this is what she experiences um, as in reality. It's something completely random that brings these kids across the radar of Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society. In the novel, it's because Queenie, the mother, is giving birth to what is expected to be child number six in this little shanty boat family, and there are problems with the birth, and that necessitates a trip to the hospital, which in Memphis at that time was all it took to bring you across the radar. This is what happens in the morning when Rill is waking up after being left to care for the younger children. Chapter 12, Rill Foss, 1939. In my dreams, we're free on the river. The Model T engine briny fixed to the back of the boat drives us up water easy. 
like we hadn't got any weight at all. Queenie sits up top of the cabin like she's riding an elephant. Her head's tossed back, her hair flowing out from under her feathery red hat. She's singing a song she learned from an old Irishman in one of the shanty camps. Well, ain't she pretty as a queen? Bryony asks me. The sun is warm and the song sparrows sing and the fat bass jump out of the water. A flock of white pelicans flies over in a big old air shape pointing north, which means we got the whole summer still ahead of us. There's not a paddle wheeler or a flatboat or a tug or an oil barge anywhere in sight. The river is ours, it's only ours. Well, and what's that make you? Briny asks me in my dream. Princess Rill of Kingdom Arcadia, I shout out. And I know I am the luckiest little girl in the whole wide world. There ain't a better place to be than our Kingdom Arcadia. Briny sets a honeysuckle flower crown on my head and he makes me a princess for real, just like the kings in all my storybooks did. In the morning, when I wake from that dream, there's still a sweet taste in my mouth. It lasts until I open my eyes and think about why my brothers and sisters and me are all five in Queenie and Briny's big bed together. We're flopped out across the mattress like a fisherman's catch, all sweaty and slick. Queenie's not here. It barely gets through my head before I know what's pulled me from my dream. My heart jumps up and I jump up with it, pulling one of Queenie's shawls over my nightgown while I cross the shanty floor. It's old Zed on the other side of the door. Old Zed who's always been like a granddaddy to all of us. But even through the window glass this morning, I can see that his white-whiskered face is long and sad. My gut pulls tight like a slipknot as I open the shanty door. Zed's hand falls heavy on my shoulder. It's meant for a comfort, but I want to run away from it. I want to scat off somewhere down the riverbank, my feet flying so fast they barely leave tracks in the washed up sand. Tears shove up my neck and I swallow hard. Queenie's babies didn't make it out, Zed says. Something inside me dies. A little brother or a sister I was planning to hold like a new china doll. Not either one of them, I ask. The doc said no. Couldn't save neither one of them. Said it wouldn't have made no matter if and Brian had got your mama to the hospital sooner. Them babies just wasn't meant for this world, that's all. I shake my head hard, trying to wick those words out of my ears like water after a swim. That can't be true, not in Kingdom Arcadia. The rivers are magic. Briny's always promised it'll take care of us. Well, but what'd Briny say, I ask. He's pretty broke up about it. I left him there at the hospital with your mama. They got some papers to sign and whatnot. The docs hadn't told her about losing the babies yet. Reckon Briny will when she's woke up good. She'll be all right, the doc said. She'll be all right. I hear it again in my head, but I know it ain't true. Nothing makes Queenie happier than a brand new sweet baby to cuddle. She's birthed all five of us without hardly more than a whimper. How could she have lost both of these two? Queenie ain't gonna be all right. Not after this. Thank you.
So in the story, as in life, it's that one little random thing, the fact that Queenie goes into labor near Memphis, the fact they dock up there, the fact that these babies can't be deli delivered on the boat. Uh, one of the things that's happened since the book came out, I've heard from a lot of people whose families really are tied into the Tennessee Children's Home Society, who were either adoptees or uh, family members on the birth side who lost children to Georgia Tan, or who are descendants of one side or the other. And, um, and the, you know, the ways these kids came into those hands are so completely random. Um, one of the things I've learned, people always ask you, what's your takeaway from a book, or what do you hope other people will take away? Uh, one of the things I learned, and I always learned something from the characters in the book, which is weird because they come out of your head, you know, so how do they know things that you kind of don't know? Um, but I always learn something from them. And one of the things that, that I learned from the characters in this story comes from the modern day character, because the story is told in two parts. So the modern day part is told through the eyes of Avery, this 30-year-old daughter of a political dynasty, senator's daughter in Aiken, South Carolina, which um, interestingly enough, I wrote this book right between elections. Nobody cared about politics. <laughs> So now everybody wants to know, are they supposed to be these people or those people? I mean, no, they're not any people that we're talking about in politics today. Um, but there's something Avery says as she's digging into the Tennessee Children's Home Society and how her family might be connected to it. Her main fear is just, was her family in any way involved in the... Um, the cover-up, you know, were they involved, were they culpable in letting this go on? Does she bear the sins of past generations? And um, she says to herself, as she's been given kind of a nice answer about what may have happened, she says to herself, it's the things you wanna believe that you need to look at the most closely of all. And that was my lesson to me, I think in this book is that those things that I want to believe, those things that fall easy on my ear and they taste sweet on my tongue and, and they fit with everything that's convenient for me, I need to dig into those things. I need to be bold enough and true enough to dig into those things and say, is this really true? Is this really plausible? Thousands of people had this going on right under the, their nose. It was not quiet. These kids were advertised in the newspaper as perfect Christmas presents. Um, people knew you could get a baby in Tennessee when you couldn't get one anywhere else. People knew that, that thousands of kids were being sent out of state, and they just believed what was easy to believe because they didn't want to confront what might be true. So that was my lesson to me. I'll finish up with kind of a fun story, and then I uh, want to take any questions you have. So in a book, you never know with the research what will be tough to research. Um, and it's never what you think. So in this book, one of the tough things was just propulsion on the river. How are the boats getting around? Because it's the end of the steam era. It's the, we're almost to World War II. Gasoline is getting big. And uh, I needed them to have a motorized skiff, a little John boat type of thing with a motor so they can get Queenie across water to the hospital and so they can go up current in the Mississippi River and, and whatnot. And so I asked my two little, um, not little anymore, fishermen I raised um, what kind of a motor would be on a John boat in 1939. And surprisingly, they could not tell me that. Uh, so I did a little research and I found this one that was called a water witch. And I like that water witch. I just thought that sounded powerful and kind of antique, and it was sold in the Sears catalog, and that water witch. So I put a water witch on the back of Zed's boat, and they used it to take Queenie across water and whatnot. And so I, it turns out as I'm working, a water witch is the hardest kind of motor to research in the entire world, as far as I can tell. I can't find out how fast can it go, how, how do you start it, how do you steer it, can it go up current in the Mississippi River, I can't find out anything. So I even go to the Motor Museum slash convenience store in Hot Springs, Arkansas to see if I can see a water witch, I can't find one. So I do what you do when you're a writer and you don't really want to give up your water witch. Um, I, you just fudge it. So 
Um, so instead of saying how they start the water witch, you say something like, and the motor roared to life. <laughs> so I do that, I send it in, it's an editorial. Uh, people in, editors in New York really don't know how you start a water witch either in 1939, so it's all going fine. I go for a writer's weekend with my favorite, uh, one of my favorite writer friends, Judy Christie, and we're down on Caddo Lake in Texas, and um, it's beautiful, so we're out on the porch, and, and Judy's very organized, so she's got our time all divided up. You know, this hour we're gonna brainstorm this book plot, and this hour we're gonna talk about the book market, and this, so she's got our day lined out. Meanwhile, in the cabin next door, Sam the fisherman is bored because it's the middle of the day, it's too hot to fish. So we're out on our deck, Sam's out on his deck. Y'all come on over, I've got iced tea. Right? Well, Sam, you know, we're working, we'll get over there later. We go out on the dock, Sam's out on his dock. Y'all come on over, I've got a swing and it's shady over here. So this goes on the whole trip. And by the end of the trip, Judy says, look, Lisa, we have to go over and see Sam's cabin because we don't hurt his feelings. So we go, and I walk into this place, and I have my iPhone, and I am like a photographer at a Paris fashion shoot. Because remember, I have raised little fishermen. I want to show them what kind of a shack they can have if they stay in college. <laughs> because this is a fisherman shack deluxe. The cabinet handles are little bobbers, little red and white bobbers. Um, the lamps are fishing poles, the shades are fishing hats, the toilet paper is on a fishing reel, <laughs> the toilet seat is clear lucite with fishing lures embedded in it. <laughs> so I take all these pictures, I turn to head out, and there in the bay window that overlooks the lake is Sam's big desk. And right beside the desk is this motor on a stand, all nicely repainted. And I get a little closer, and I see the W. And I get a little closer, and I look at Sam, and I say, is that a water witch? <laughs> and Sam says, yes, that's my 1939 fully restored water witch. So I take two lessons from that because I believe everything in life comes with a lesson. Uh, one is that never give up on your research because you never know when it's just going to fall in your lap. And secondly, you should never ignore your neighbors. So questions, what else, um, what can I tell you about the story? Um, hi, I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy of the book and loved it. Um, but was very compelled to it because my grandmother um, was actually put in an orphanage when her father was killed in an automobile accident and her mother could not care for five kids. So I was wondering if you had discovered other incidents or have heard of other incidents similar to the one in Tennessee because my grandmother was in South Carolina at the time. So I'm just wondering if this has brought out more history um, that you have perhaps come across that you didn't know about? Yes, um, so has it brought out more history? Were there other places where this went on? There certainly were. In fact, not too far from there in Augusta, Georgia, there was a lawyer who was kind of doing the same thing even afterward. Um, and even in recent times, there are states that have their adoption laws so loosely regulated, it's very easy to bring in a woman from Russia or some other country and uh, call her a resident of the state and then sell her baby into a very expensive private adoption. So similar things still go on. Um, there were other orphanages also where this kind of thing was going on. Some of it was a creature of the time. Some of it definitely was uh, a creature of some social engineering. The idea, Georgia Tan could say right out in public um, in, in newspaper articles things like, 
if you, if you take them from these cows and these breeders and you place them with people of high type and surround them with beauty and culture, they can become anything you want them to be. Uh, she purported the children as blank slates and, um, and, and basically, you know, that, that, that they, people could mold them into anything they wanted. And it was a recipe for very bad adoptions because um, a child is not a blank slate. Even a baby is not a blank slate. And certainly a five, six, seven-year-old who knows that he or she has a family is not a blank slate. So um, in some ways, yes, it was a creature of a time period when people really had no other options sometimes but to leave a child in an orphanage. And the idea was sort of that the parents were almost, uh, or that the adoptive families or the families who took them in were almost doing them a, a favor by taking them in, um, which sounds like you have some of that history in your family and probably looked at the story in a different way because of that. Um, people have asked me a lot how she got away with it, and um, really, uh, she was not someone anyone would have suspected. Part of the reason she got away with it is because she came from the upper crust of society. She was a judge's daughter. Um, she drove around in a limousine, she lived in a mansion, she was not anyone anyone would have suspected of needing or wanting to be selling children. Yes? Hi, so this is more of a question about craft, I guess, but you're such a prolific writer, I guess I wanted to hear some of your insights about kind of the uh, hard work that it takes to you know, produce each book from start to finish and what you've kind of learned over the years about the process side of things. Okay, so the writing process. Um, writing process is a tough thing because it's so individual, it's different for everybody. And so I always feel a little bit, um, a little bit like when I talk about writing process, I wanna first say, but if this isn't the way you do it, that's fine because there is no right way. For me, I'm not, um, I'm not an advanced plotter so much. I have a rough react structure of the story in my mind. And I always start out when I have a piece of truth that I wanna talk about, I always start out with just thinking, who would, who would tell that story? What, what eyes are you going to look at this story through? And then I have sort of a rough three-act structure that comes partly just from imagination and partly from the research. And, uh, and if you're curious about that, there's, I used to teach a class in three-act structure, and because every story is structured that way. And uh, if you're curious about it, you can go to my website. I don't teach a class anymore, but the materials are on there. And, um, and that's helpful to me, but a lot of the story is going to develop out of the research, out of the time uh, uh, as I'm writing it. Sometimes I will literally quit for the day thinking, uh, one thing will happen and I'll wake up in the morning with something else in mind, so I never know. Uh, I write a certain amount every day. It, it, different people are different, but if I sat around and waited to f until I felt inspired, or yeah, I, I just would never write. I mean, for me, it's a little like sitting down every day to take the ACT test. <laughs> it's just hard. And I think uh, what foils most people is, is finding some kind of a groove you can get into. Uh, you know, we all have our, we're kind of like baseball players, you know, different ones do different things to kind of get in the groove to get up to bat. And I think for a writer, that's one of the most valuable things. You just find what gets you in your groove and then um, figure out how you're gonna get back in the groove day after day after day. I'm a fairly fast writer. I, I, can, I can turn out a book in four or five months. Um, a, a manuscript, and you know, that's not right for everybody, but it's what works for me. Hi, I actually have two questions. One, what are you working on now? And then in your research, did you have an opportunity to meet anyone from the children's home or descendants of people who had been in the home? Okay, so what am I working on now? Um, I am working on a new book. I just 
just recently. I had actually kind of started and finished a manuscript about something I'd had in mind for a while to write about. And then uh, a few months ago, history lightning struck again. And I just came across another piece of history and thought, oh, you know, this is really the story I want to do next. I feel such a passion for this story. And I would tell you about it, except um, I'm not allowed to. <laughs> But, uh, but it, every story is its own, you know, it's the same process. It's discovering the history and how to make it work within the story. And I'm so excited to bring to light this piece of history because it's another one that involved so many people. I'm like, how, how do people not know about this? Um, what was the second question? Did you have an opportunity in your research to meet any of the people who had been in the home or descendants of those? To meet the real people. So, uh, yes. That's, so I had met a couple and interviewed them when I started out. And it was odd because neither one of them, they were okay to talk to me, but they didn't want me using their name anywhere. In other words, they didn't want to be outed as having been adopted from the Tennessee Children's Home Society. So the book comes out, I start hearing from adoptees and families of adoptees and families who are still searching for family members that they've never found. And um, then people start asking me, would you ever get a reunion together of people who are connected to? So last summer, in, uh, last, this past June, I had an event in Memphis. And so we did have a reunion and got about 25 of them together. And they ran the gamut from uh, people who were adopted as babies, people who were old enough to remember um, four daughters of a woman who was stolen with her six siblings out of the front yard of their little shanty house. Um, so it was, it was quite an experience, and we ended up doing a couple presentations where they got on panels and talked about their experience. And, um, and many of them had reunited with family and things, and so it was an amazing experience. I think we're on last question. We've got just a couple more minutes. Well, I was just going to ask you about that. My mother was one of the children from the Memphis Children's Home, and um, she was constantly trying to find her mother and never did before she passed away. So you were just saying that there are stories of reconciliation between uh, children who were adopted and then were able to reunite with their own parents. Can you say what that was like? There are many. Um, there was a woman in Memphis, Denny Glad, who uh, is kind of like the Trent Turner character in the book who helped a lot of adoptees find their paperwork and find their families. One of the things that made it hard was that so much paperwork was altered. So a lot of times when people got, they fought for years to get the records open because Tennessee had sealed all the records. Once they did, a lot of times the records were incorrect and didn't help. So um, Denny Glad was instrumental in not only getting the paperwork opened, but in helping people read between the lines and going around and, and um, checking court docket books and all kinds of things. And she did help reunite many who found their birth families, often with wonderful results, sometimes not. You know, it just, it just depends. And there are many who, um, like your mother, who they'll, they'll just never know. That's one of the reasons why everybody doesn't reunite in the novel, because I felt like it wasn't fair, because there are so many people who will have to just live with those questions um, all their lives. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. yes. I, I was wondering, I know, have noted some timeliness of your book subject to current events, and wonder if you saw an increase in sales after the uh, children were separated from their parents at the border? So many people, yes, many people have equated what was happening with Tennessee Children's Home Society with the children, um, with the border crisis for the children. Oddly, that was coming up in June, right as I was meeting with these people whose life experience is tied into this. And what I learned from them is, and even the children and grandchildren of these people, what happens to children, the damage done to children travels down through the generations. The people, um, the just descendants will tell you this experience, even people who were adopted as babies and had wonderful adoptive parents, they will tell you that, that this experience being tied into Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society and what happened 
informed everything about my mother's life or everything about my grandmother's life. And so, you know, I think, yeah, the lesson to learn from it is that um, whatever adult battles are going on, children should never pay the price for them uh, because that goes down. So. One minute. I was wondering about the um, famous people, or the people that had adopted these parents. What ever happened to Did they have to give them up? I mean, when, when it was found out that they had adopted these children, it must have been um, hard for the children as well. And whatever happened to them, were they, were they ever, I mean, is it criminal or what happened? Nobody was ever prosecuted. Georgia Tan died as the scandal was breaking, so she was not prosecuted, but that made it very easy for everyone to just say, oh, it was just her and she had everybody fooled because she was dead at that point, so you know, she was a very easy scapegoat. Um, no children were sent back to their birth families. Of the 22 who were in custody of the Tennessee Children's Home Society at, at the end when the scandal broke, only two were given to their birth family, back to their birth families, and the rest were adopted out. Well, what about Ju June Allison and, and these things? Uh, they, uh, none of those children were sent back to their birth families. Um, the records were quickly and quietly sealed, and life went on. And we only know now that that's what happened? I mean, did anyone know at the time that June Allison and Joan Crawford had adopted these children? Or? You know, some of them did in, in adult life go back and find their birth families um, back in Tennessee. And not all of the children were stolen. A lot of them were children who had been given up by families who couldn't raise them or whatever. I see. So there was no embarrassment for, James, for, for these famous people? They... No. It was in the press a lot, but they, they just all said our adoption was legitimate and we didn't pay um, anything but the normal fees, and, and that was it. Thank you.